New Yorkers and people from around the world love to eat. You know, it's a manja. They love food. They love restaurants. So I have today a person who really personifies Mr. Restaurateur of New York, Mr. Restaurateur of the world, the legendary Tony May, the, pr the proprietor, the owner of SD26, but much more. Uh. Thank, Thank you. you, Michael. Nice to be here. So, Tony, you know, you, you were born, uh, hey, I shouldn't talk about age, but you were born in 1937, let, my ca let them calculate. You were born uh, the oldest of eight children. Uh, your mother's still alive in Italy. Uh, you were born at the foot of Naples, you said. Like, well, Torre del Greco. Torre del Greco. Your father was a, uh, a, a captain of a boat. A sea captain. And he followed his, his grand, your grandfather, yes. who had the same boat. That's so right. during the war, what was your father doing, you were saying to me? He was working for the military in Taranto, you know, ferrying uh, uh, the military from one place to another. And uh, we did very well. We, uh, during the war, although, you know, it was very tough to get food and water and things like that, we were lucky enough to get everything we needed. Yeah, so during, so the war ends, and at 13, you go to hotel school, and you're learning about the hotel and hospitality. And then at the age of 20, you get on the boat yourself, but not, not the, the, the food boat. You get on the, the cruise business. Yeah, well, actually, I, my first job, I was 17 years old, and I uh, uh, worked as a, <clears throat> as a um, porter in one of the cruise ships and uh, uh, was going to... Uh, uh, doing uh, trips to South America. You know, I was in Buenos Aires the day they overthrew Peron. Boy. That's how many years ago. I think that was 1955, something like that. And uh, it was uh, just an incredible experience because we heard all these firecrackers and we thought it was a holiday. It was, a, you know, and before you know it, we see planes uh, diving into the Rio de la Plata. You know, with uh, thing. it was uh, quite an experience, yeah. and the captain at that point had just left the dock and got that you know in high seas. <laughs> now, over the period of time that you were on the boat, you, you said to me, you know, especially with the eight brothers and sisters, you were sending money home. More money was going home than was in your pocket, right? Well, you know, uh, so, you know, I, I normally don't talk about that, but uh, basically, you know, remember, I was, I am the first of eight kids. My father is the only one working, and everything, you know, it was not that easy. So when I took a job, uh, what I did, I just made a, a, an agreement with the purse to send all my salary home, and I kept all the tips I made. The tips I made was more than the salary that oh, was going okay. on, <laughs> so, and so I had a good time now, with that. Now, but on the boat, you were a captain, you were a maitre d', you were a waiter over the period of time, and you, so now it's, you're, what, 23 years of age or something, it's 19... I was 25. 25. Well, 1963. 1963, and you decide, you want, because you, as you said to me, you spoke English rather well, you wanted to come over to America. And you had met people on the boats all the time, you know, people who worked on the boats. You met a young lady, uh, and you met this guy by the name of Surio, who happens to have a little restaurant called uh, the Cirque today. And you come over, and what happens? You go to visit Surio? Well, you know, when, uh, <clears throat> first of all, I came to America. I, beside, you know, my girlfriend and beside a few friends that I had, uh, I really did not know anybody, neither I knew any restaurant people <coughs> that would give me a job. So I used to go from door to door looking for a job. And after the first job, I realized that, uh, you know, the, I was in a different world. It was, uh, you know, I had uh, um, worked in Europe and, I, you know, my experience was uh, um, uh, very, you know, in-depth uh, between, uh, you know, uh, uh, between restaurants in uh, Switzerland, in France, all, you know, all, uh, in uh, in Italy, uh, I had been, uh, you know, dining room manager, I think. I came here, I worked as a waiter. And then as I worked with the waiter, you know, I would do things the way I used to do it. And these guys uh, turned around and says, you know, that I didn't know what I was doing. So it was very depressing. See, 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 what am, what am good, I doing you here? You see, the good part <laughs> is you decided to, your first apartment was where I grew up.
you went to Brooklyn. You That's went to right. Brooklyn, you went to Fort Hamilton Parkway and 66th Street. And But you, as you said to me, you had a plan. You wanted like five weeks here, five weeks here, well, and you wanted to gain the experience. And one of the places you worked was with Serio uh, yes. at, at the colony. Well, one, you know, when, uh, when after my first job, I realized that there was, a, you know, I had a cultural problem. You know, I had to understand the way they work here, the way the customers react, the way the owners of the restaurant want to work. Because everybody had their own way of working. There was not one set system like in Europe. So I decided that I was going to go on a, some kind of training program. And I said, OK, I'm going to stay five weeks in each restaurant. And my first restaurant was the Colony. Uh, Jean Cavallero, the owner, and Sirio Maccioni, the maitre d'. And I was there for a few weeks, uh, five weeks. Uh, then I, my second job was 21 Club. That's when I met Jerry Burns, with whom I eventually had a very good friendly, you know, friendship relationship with. Um, that my third job was at Torsini. At the time, Torsini was a the top Italian restaurant uh, in America, in New York anyway. And then uh, uh, I worked at a restaurant called La Mediterranee, which uh, is another restaurant uh, today. There's been a number of restaurants that have turned. Now, at this time, you were still Anthony. Yes, you, at you, that you, time, I was still Anthony Magliulo. Right, before yes, Tony May. That's right. And so then you, you find a job, you go to work for uh, Oscar. Oscar Del Monaco in the, in the, in Beaver in the Street. business district, uh, the corner of Beaver and uh, Williams. And uh, one day, uh, it's uh, an old uh, captain uh, uh, takes me on the side and says, look, you look like you're a smart kid. Why don't you go and look for a job at the Rainbow Room? Jerry Brody has just taken over uh, the Rainbow Room and he has some big plans to make this a more, you know, a, a leading I mean, the restaurant. legendary Rainbow Room, yeah. Rockefeller Center, the top so, over there. Well, I said, OK, uh, and I did go. I went to look for a job and... Uh, uh, I got the job, and um, and then uh, so what was I, your job? Uh, your first job at the Rainbow. Well, my Road. first job was a captain. I worked as a captain. They put me on the door, and uh, you know uh, we had you know a lot of uh, things. I was learning every day what was going on. Then I started working in the in the dining room, and then eventually I became the maitre d, then assistant manager. Eventually, I managed it, and the 10 years after the day... No, but, but, yeah. Before we get to the... Yes. Okay, so you, you, you're working over there, you, you're operating and manager, and then you said to me you wanted to, you went to management. You were making more money, but you, you wanted to go into management. Yeah, I, was in, I was working as a metro D, and I figured that if I was going to f continue working as a metro D, that's all I was going to get. I couldn't get any higher. Where do I go? What is in the future? Do I have to look at myself working you know, it's a metro D all my life. So I decided to go into management. And this is when, you know, I, I started as a system manager and eventually as a manager. Now, so at this time, I mean, Rockefeller Center was owned by the Rockefeller family. Yes. And subsequently, uh, you're saying, hey, I don't know what's going to happen. We're not sure what Jerry, what's going to happen with Jerry Brody's lease. You decide... I don't know why you decide to go to New Jersey. You find one of your customers, which is unusual because sometimes people talk and they say, you know, Tony, one day I'll give you, you'll be in business. Yeah. Here, this guy said, let's go into business. So you opened up a place called La Page. La Page. Well, you know, um, it was a very, you know, sort of a transition period where uh, uh, Jerry Brody, I, I think he had decided really not, did not really want to be at the Rainbow Room anymore. And, uh, and uh, I sort of perceived that, and, uh, um, and I thought that there might be a chance that we could be offered the lease, myself and Brian Daly, who was uh, working as vice president of the Brody Corporation at the time. And, uh, but uh, if I had stayed there as a manager, from an ethical point of view, I don't believe that the Rockefeller Center would have offered that opportunity to us. So I decided I was going to leave. And I took a sort of a bit of a gamble. And uh, D'Agostino wanted to open a restaurant in New Jersey because he had just built a big restaurant, right, he had built a big the, building, and he wanted to put a restaurant. University in Towers in yes. Hackensack. So I made a deal with him, and uh, I opened a restaurant called La Pache. And we got three stars from the Times. We got a lot of very good reviews. We were doing very good business. And then in October of the same year, I got a phone call from Rockefeller Center 
asking me if I was interested to get the lease of the Rainbow Room. And obviously, you know, that is the typical thing, you know, they make you an offer you can refuse. And this was a typical example of that uh, statement. So they gave you the offer that you couldn't refuse, but you needed some money. So you and Brian yes. uh, come up and you put a quarter of a million dollars in the business. Yes. And the interesting thing is that since which you- Which we borrowed. Which you borrowed, but you, but you understood the restaurant so well, you were able to pay this back in six months. Yes because of the success. You know, one of the things that we did, uh, as soon as we took over the Rainbow Room, I did one thing that I, I had tried for a long time to have Jerry, Jerry do, you know, Jerry Brody do, and that is put dancing in the Rainbow Room. The Rainbow Room was built to be a dancer, then, you know, to be a club. And it was such a natural thing for me to come up with that kind of idea, but Jerry would never do it because he was afraid he was going to compete with the acts that we had in the Rainbow Grill. So, uh, um, um, so the first thing I did when we took over, the first day, boom, I put the Rainbow Room. I put dancing in the Rainbow Room. And, uh, and we tripled the business overnight, number one. I had Cy Oliver as the, buying, as the as house band. You know, he was the arranger for the Dorsey Band and everything else. And then, uh, you know, uh, the rest is history. We brought the business uh, you know, to a, to a particular level. I think we put the Rainbow Room back on the map, even although we never got the credit for it because more. I know you did. That's, <laughs> forget the credit, you're gonna get the credit today. So what happens is most people who had the Rainbow Room only had 10 year leases. You, you lasted longer than that. And you were there for what, 13 years? Well, no, I uh, uh, was at the Rainbow Room for 22 years. No, no, but from I, when as, I started, as the 11 owner. years. 11 years, but uh, traditionally the, the, the Rainbow Room always changes operator every 10 years. You know, first there was Union News, uh, then there was uh, Jerry Brody, he was there for 10 years, then there was myself, we were there 11 years, then there was uh, jo Joe Baum, he was there for 10, 11 years, something like that, and then uh, Cipriani was there, and he was there for about 10 years. And, so, uh, it's an and, and now there's no one there. Yeah, I mean, it's, and then now it's empty. It's so, a shame so, that so, that place is still empty. So what happens is after that, they're building this equitable center, Ben Holloway, equitable organization, and they say, we want to make showcase restaurants. We want to showcase. La Bernadette opens over there, and they say, Tony, open up. At this time, you're Tony May. You, you changed the name. Yes, uh, I changed that in 1968 when I took over as a manager. So Tony May says, I'm going to open up this place everybody knew. It was called Palio, with the, the, the huge paintings, everything. We used to take the elevator up there. So that was Palio, right? Well, you know, that was uh, uh, Ben Alloway, who was at the time the chairman of Equitable Real Estate, and Jerry Spire. You know, Jerry was the... Uh, um, his company, you know, represented uh, uh, the real estate in the in the area. So they called me. At first, I said no because it was too small for the way I was now accustomed to work with. And uh, then eventually, um, um, Ben, you know, uh, Alloway uh, made me another offer, and I accepted it. And uh, and I opened Palio, which I think at the time it was. Uh, my opinion, it was the best restaurant in the country. Forget about Italian, the best period. I mean, this was, a, it was at the, you know, the first time a restaurant has a big, huge mural uh, done by one of the major uh, artists in the world, the Sandro Chia. Um, we had um, uh, uh, the architect of the restaurant was Raul de Armas. Uh, the, um, um, uh, the art uh, and all the design was by Massimo Vignelli. I, I think that every piece in that restaurant was so cared for. And we, I, to, I brought in a chef from Merano called Andrea Elrigo, who had, uh, was one of the top, uh, had one of the top Relais Chateau in, in Europe uh, at the time. He agreed to come to America. And the way this chef w worked, it's sort of, you know, when he handled the food, it looked like he was making love to the food. You know, that's how good he was. And we, uh, he cooked anything from uh, uh, food from Sicily all the way to his native uh, uh, country of Merano. 
and uh, we had a great time. Uh, and uh, you know, it's unfortunate the Palio did not last into time. That, that is, was my intention with the way I set it up. Now, but, now, uh, during that time, did you own La Camellia and sandals? Or the well, La Camellia and, uh, uh, was done uh, when my brother came over from Italy. Rather than have him work with me, I said, okay, we're going to open a restaurant. And we opened an Italian restaurant on 58th Street, between the 2nd and 3rd, called La Camellia. And did very well. Then he decided to go to, to Connecticut and they just closed the and restaurant. Then I opened Sandro on 59th Street, uh, under the, under the uh, 59th Street Bridge. And um, I brought Sandro from Italy in 1984. And, uh, you know, when it was Sandro first opened, it was a great success. So, so now you go to Central Park. You go to 240 Central Park West. You open up San Domenico. Yes. And you're there for 20 years. That's right. Uh, and, and during that period of time, you also get involved with the Trade Center. You go to, G uh, yes. what do you do at the Trade Center? Well, you know, uh, we opened uh, San Domenico in 1988. Um, and uh, in, uh, in, together with a, a namesake restaurant in Imola in Italy called San Domenico. And uh, once the restaurant got going, then uh, I was offered to open uh, restaurant at, at the World Trade Center by uh, uh, by the the people that uh, owned it, and uh, I did uh, uh, the portatori that is, and, uh, um, and we opened Gemelli in 1997, and pasta break, which is a fast food pasta restaurant, down in the, in the concourse level, and they were both doing great until 9/11 came and uh, we lost them, but we did, I just did not lose the restaurants. I lost the business. You know, insurance pays you back. You know, first of all, they never pay you pay a hundred percent, although we got, you know, money back. Uh, and then if you want to rebuild it, it cost you a lot more than what thing. We just, you know, we just, uh, uh, has been a tough time to recover from that. Now, what about Port Chester? When did you open up the restaurant in Port Chester? I opened at uh, sometime around the 1991, uh, uh, 92. And I had it for three years. I was never lucky enough to get the right person that I wanted to come in, bring in as a, as a, as a partner, you know, so they could run the thing. So I sold it after three years that I had it. So it's 2008, and your daughter had joined you. Uh, she had went to NYU, and she'd been working with you at San Domenico. Yes. And you decide uh, to go to, the, uh, to Madison Square Park. And you, you find this location for SD26. Well, my uh, lease was up, uh, was going to expire in June of 2008, and I did, was not able to make a, a, a deal with uh, the landlord. So I, and uh, if I had stayed in that location, I would have had to redo the restaurant anyway, and I would have spent a, a lot of money regardless. So I decided to do. Uh, to move, and uh, because I wanted also to do a restaurant which was much more, more contemporary, a restaurant projected into the future, a restaurant that uh, uh, was at more energy and more in keeping with my daughter. You know, I am, you know, more or less not at the end of my career because my career will never end. But my, but my daughter, uh, you know, I mean, I like the fact that you have that iPad over yeah, there for the wine. Yeah, yeah, you, know, daughter, you just can go. <laughs> my daughter's ideas are uh, very, you know, very good, and uh, she, and I thought that this restaurant reflected more a personality than mine. But nevertheless, I work behind the house. I love to do the food. I love to work with the cooks, the chef, while Marisa takes care of everything else that is more visible to the public. Now, during your career, you started this association. Uh, you wrote, uh, you, let's talk, there was a book? Yes. Well, you know, uh, I am, uh, um, uh, when I first came to America, you know, they served Italian cuisine, which I did not understand, and they spoke a language that I did not know what the hell they were talking about. And uh, I, um, um, uh, I decided that if I ever had a chance, I would like to try and do something about it. I don't think that I have changed the perception of Italian cuisine, but I think I've contributed toward that, that end. And in 1979, when I, you know, I had the management of the Rainbow Room, I instituted a, uh, a, gruppo, a, a group called the Gruppo Ristoratori Italiani, whose intent was to, uh, to uh, promote a better understanding of Italian food and wine products. 
And today we are still doing it. Now, when did you write the book? I wrote the book uh, when I was, uh, well, at, at San Domenico, I wrote the book. There was, uh, you know, everybody's asking all for recipes all the time. So I, we wrote a book which, but basically I did not quite really write the book for the consumer. I wrote the book for the schools, for the students, because there was not, there isn't a single manual that the students can go and, and follow and get all the ABC of Italian cuisine. Sure, there is an awful lot of books out, but most of them are all team, are all you know, related to soup, main course. So there's, there's very little that is at the student level that encompasses the entire spectrum of Italian cuisine. Now, with regard to students, we were talking you know, a couple of weeks ago, you're, 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 inv you're working on a, stu a program with students for education. Isn't there yes. another program? Let's tell me about that. Well, you know, I put together a foundation uh, a few years back called the Italian Culinary Foundation. With that foundation, I work with uh, uh, institutions from Italy that uh, sponsor certain programs that we do in schools throughout the country. And we bring, us to, we bring uh, 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 instru instructors from Italy. We send them to school for a given period of time. And in the, with, together with the instructor, we all send the products because it is in, Italian cuisine is a cuisine of product. But unless you have the product, how the, the instructors cannot work and explain it to them. So we send the instructor, we send the product, and then we teach Italian cuisine based on the principle that Italian cuisine is no longer strictly tied in to the, uh, to the, uh, um, to the uh, fragmented image of the regionality or the folkloric look of Italian cuisine. Italian cuisine has stepped up. Today, is, is, we eat Italian a lot better in America. Certainly, we eat a lot better in New York. And I think that uh, it is, uh, uh, it is uh, a credit to Gruppo Ristoratori Italiani for having helped in doing that. One of the things that I did over the years, since 1979, every year I take uh, a group of, uh, of colleagues uh, of part of the group, we go to Italy and we visit it, a, a region. And, uh, and together with that, I've, I've always brought with me 10 journalists. Uh, 10 journalists uh, that uh, did not necessarily have to write. All we wanted them is to experience uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the culture of the Italian table. And, uh, uh, and uh, they all uh, eventually, you know, they sort of keep it, you know, they maintain what they learn. And when they have to write, they understand certain things a lot better than they did before. And in the same way, you're bringing Italian wine, a lot of Italian wine. The same, we, when, we, when we take our trips, we go to food producers and then we also go to wine producers. And uh, we... Uh, uh, we learn about the new technology, we learn about the new varietals, we learn, because there is always a continuous discovery in Italy of the new varietals which were used during the Roman time, if you will, or the new varietals which were brought in from Greece at the very beginning, when Calabria was not called Calabria, it was called Enotria. Now, also, the, the, uh, the organic wines and, and the change of the, the way they're making wine, wasn't that part of also? Well, you know, all this organic thing is, uh, you know, is, uh, I, I am not sure I endorse all this organic uh, uh, posture. You know, we, uh, there's, there's been a millions of dollars spent to try and, uh, and get the bugs out of everything. And now, while well, we are saying, no, no, the bugs have to stay there. Oh, the bugs are no, good. No, I mean, you know, that's not the way, you know, I mean, that's eating better. I'm not sure that that is a thing, but if you, grow things and you control what what you you know how you, you uh, help yourself and make everything grow healthy i think is a lot better than just going around and saying you know organically uh, so, so you know so you know in conclusion you know you look at it this way you know the, the kid who started on the boat who came over with this plan you know the five weeks here five weeks there I think you've done a lot over there, especially in Lower Manhattan, all through Manhattan and through the, the educational programs. You know, you have truly been the restaurateur 
of New York and the world, and I'd like to thank you for being here today. Listen, I enjoy what I do, and I enjoy being with you today. Thank you. Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Beachwood Organization, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, the Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates, Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Markham LLP, Marcus Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Moynian Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, Sterling and Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group.